The Lord be with you. All right, let's dive right in here to the book of Revelation. Lord Jesus, you gave us this book, Lord, to know you. You gave us this book to reveal you. To reveal you as lover of our souls, to reveal you as our God, to reveal you as king of kings, to reveal you as the great judge, and so many more things. And so, God, above all, I pray that you would grow larger. Not that you aren't large, but at least in our minds and our understanding of who you are, that it would grow larger tonight, Father. And that you would do what the book is meant to do. Exalt yourself and to help us, Father, to find courage to fight this, this glorious, not fight, but to enter into this glorious spiritual walk until one day we spend eternity with you. So help this word to come alive to us tonight, we pray. Amen. Amen. A couple of you are new. Class, what is the point of the book of Revelation? Reveal and exalt Jesus Christ. Any teacher that focuses on a bunch of other stuff over that is not doing his or her proper job. Now, along with that, as we know, there are many different perspectives on the book of Revelation. My goal is to help us stay right in the text. We're not going to jump out onto wild rabbit trails or too much of any of that. We're going to stay right with the text. There are going to be things I teach that if you listen to a lot of modern teachers on the television and even the radio will sound very different than what you're used to hearing. And so I leave it to you to discern through the Spirit which is right. And then once you agree with me, just kidding, but... And I say that because tonight is one of those chapters where there begins to be a divide between different perspectives on what the book of Revelation is about. And so we're going to jump right in. But before we do, somebody without looking at your Bible, can anybody, as a, as a class, can you remember the different horses that were released to do damage across the earth? Give me one color. Red. We got red. What did the red horse do? I'll stick with the colors. What else? Besides red, what else? Pale or like a grayish yellow, green white death right black i think that was we get them all yeah okay we got them all so this is important in the book of revelation it is not written in chronological order we are so used to reading scripture in like the book of acts we just went through it we read about all the way through the disciples peter's life paul's life all the way to the end right when we read the book of Revelation, you're going to constantly see what we're going to see tonight, where he makes the comments like, uh, after this I saw. After this is not a chronological statement. That's very important. After this means he was given a different vision. I'm sure most of us have watched TV shows or especially movies where they get one person's perspective, then they do a cutback, and they give you another person's perspective, how they overlap and come together. If you've ever seen the Lord of the Rings movies, it's always Frodo and Samwise's perspective, and then the rest of the team's perspective. And then in the very end, the two perspectives are happening simultaneously, and in the very end, they all come together. I saw a movie many, many years ago. I had to remember, write the title down because I couldn't remember it. It had been so long. Called Bad Times at the El Royale. I don't know if you ever saw it. You ever see that movie? Am I remembering right? It was like a bunch of different cut-ins, right? You saw one person's perspective, then another person's perspective, then another perspective. And that is how the book of Revelation is written. So that the parts pile on top of each other to add color. It's like we had, it's as if chapter 6 was a blue piece of paper. And chapter 7 is a green piece, or a yellow piece of paper. What color are they going to make if you look at them together? The public system just fails you. <laughs> Blue and yellow make green. green. Yes. <laughs> You're still one of my favorites, Sharon, but we'll work on colors later. So, yes. But you put the two together and you get one. So what we're going to do is the, the writer of, or the, the book of Revelation, John's writings, chapter 6 is meant to have chapter 7 come on top of it to color in the rest of the picture so that understand we're looking at the same time frame but two different visions from different perspectives is that 
make sense to everybody? That is vital to our understanding. So we were just introduced to these uh, really demonic entities that came into God's presence in chapter 6, and God was releasing them to the four winds, meaning across all the earth. Now we're going to jump back for a moment when we begin chapter 7. Because he starts again by saying what in the first four couple words? This, I saw, which means it's a new vision that he had. And just as a side note, that's why the book of Isaiah is one of the hardest ones to teach because he jumps all over the place. And it's really, what he writes is brilliant, but it's really difficult to teach because he jumps all over in the same way. The prophetic writers will do that. So after this, he says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land, the sea, or the tree. Now, who were the four winds in chapter 6? They were the horsemen, right? They were the ones being released like the four winds going across. And so we're going back in time, so to speak, to the beginning of chapter 6, and he's saying that God had four angels who said, hold on a second, before he lets the angels, the demons of destruction go across the earth. Now, a reminder for those of you that haven't been part of the, this class for the last month is that when we look at the book of Revelation, it was written to the people around 80, 90 AD, and the book was meant for them and to span across time until Christ comes again. So from the perspective of John, this is the end times. Like the, the new covenant represents the end times, okay? So keep that in mind. So we had all these different horses wanting to go and cut loose and do damage across the earth. All of a sudden, four angels are standing at the corners of the earth, and they're holding them back. So in your mind, all the red, the red horse, the black horse death, picture an angel holding the reins of those horses before they're ready to let them go. And that's where we are. Does everybody feel comfortable with what I've just shared? Under everybody understand? Okay. Then he said, I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. Now, we understand that doesn't mean an animal, right? It means that he had the seal of God upon them. Um, just to make it simple, it's like when you go into an amusement park and they ticket your hand so you can go in and out. It's like a seal. It's a marking of what... Uh, of your allow, being allowed to go in and out. A seal of a living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Now, again, this is where confusion can come because demons are angels, right? They're fallen angels. So the terminology here can get tricky. And so you have to make sure you know, is he talking to the angels that are the demonic ones about to be released? Or is he talking to the ones holding the harnesses and holding them back? And I know this will sound a little confusing, but it will all come together beautifully in just a moment. So just hang with me for a little bit. Okay. Uh, he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to do harm to the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. Now, most people know enough about revelation that they know that the mark of the beast is what and we will get into what that means in future weeks but understand before the beast the evil one marks his people what is god doing he's marking his people and as always you don't have to follow me in the scripture but i invite you to uh, take a moment and and write down what i put down hey thrill good to have you bud so in a in Ephesians chapter, let me get to my, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth and the gospel of salvation. So Paul's talking to people who had received Christ. Does everybody follow that? Yeah. Having believed, you were what? Marked. Another word in the Greek is sealed. That word can be used interchangeably depending on its context. So you were marked or sealed, or you were marked with, uh, in him with a seal. And the seal, let me ask, before you look, before you, if you haven't looked there, what do you think the seal is 
That's on every believer that has lived since the time of John to the time that Jesus comes again. What? The sign of the cross? That's a great guess, and I would argue that that's part of our, our sealing, uh, but that is not what's referred to here in Ephesians. <laughs> yes, you do. But at baptism, what happens? You're born again, and after you're born again, who does God give you? The Holy Spirit. That's what it is. After you're born again, the Spirit of God dwells in us, and we become what uh, Paul says, temples of the Holy Spirit. And so let me go back and read this verse again with that in mind. It says, And you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. Having believed in him, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit of guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption when he comes again that is how you know you're a follower of christ is that the spirit of god is dwelling in you now let me ask how do you know if the spirit of god is dwelling in you the fruits of the spirit should be seen certainly not to perfection but at least a changing in the fruits yeah that the Spirit himself is the one who helps us believe in the first place. So that's part of it, Greg. The Spirit brings a conviction? Absolutely. And one thing that I look at, and it's not exactly an exact thing, but if all of a sudden your desire is to please God. So if I go out tonight and I beat some guy up, before I was a Christian, I might brag about it and feel pretty good about how tough I am afterwards as a believer if i've done something so so terrible then there should be a conviction in my heart that i have offended god now we can sometimes fight with that conviction or try to push it away at times and it's called grieving the spirit but you're grieving him because he's a part of you and that's the difference <clears throat> is the christian in the big picture longs to want to please god with their lives i mean that should be pretty basic right <clears throat> but that's what the holy spirit does for us so all right, so we are sealed is what the book of Revelation tells us. Let me come back. So uh, they put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. Now this is just a, a fun piece of information and, and it's kind of a side note type of thing. But in the book of, oh, I didn't highlight it. I'm going to I'd have to do it by memory. That's tough. In the book of, Numbers, I believe it is, I think chapter 13. I'm sorry, I forgot to type out the number. There's a place where Aaron, who is the priest, that they seal him. The, the word is actually used. It says, create a seal, put it on Aaron's head, and mark him as the high priest. Now, in the New Testament, who is the high priest? Or who is, who is the priesthood, of, uh, uh, who is part of the priesthood in the New Testament? Jesus is our high priest, but who is the priesthood? Exactly, right? Does anybody remember what scripture? Yes, it says, you, as believers in Christ, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so you can declare his praises. <laughs> that, that was uh, 1 Peter 2. Yeah. And so what we have here. Oh, I'm sorry. The first passage was Exodus 28. I did write it down. Exodus 28, you'll see that God will create a special seal to mark the Old Testament priesthood. And then he'll do the same for the New Testament priesthood by giving us the Holy Spirit. And we are all a part of it now. Pretty cool, right? <coughs> Always. I'd prefer to wait to get into that. It's the number of man, just the short, short definition, it's the number of man, which means it's the number of the flesh. It's the number of the part of us that rebels against God. And so it's in a sense a demonic number because he was the one who first rebelled against God. That's the simple, simple uh, uh, explanation. No, it's a great question. <laughs> the 
Right, so it's lack of completeness, because it's less. That, that's also true. Yeah, now what it is not most likely is some little microchip that they put underneath you that says 666. Now, I'm not saying that, our, that governments in the world one day won't use that stuff, and it won't be part making it difficult for Christians. It very well could. But I'm just saying that the chip itself is not the 666. That's just a uh, part of it. Anyway, but I don't want to go there quite yet. So... All right, so we are the priesthood of the new believers. And so everyone has the picture in their head. The horses are being held back, the horses of destruction, before God marks all of his people as his. So does God know who is going to be a Christian and who's not from the time of Jesus to the time he comes again? Because God lives what? Outside of time, right? So does that mean you are forced to become a Christian against your will? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just simply means that God in all his wisdom has already predestined and knows who's going to be a believer and who's not. That's what it's saying to us. And so that's really important for where we're going to go next. So in verse 4, what's that? No, it, it does, but it, it does, but it's, it does, but it doesn't because... I'm sure you don't remember the fancy little illustration I used where I put the string across and how we all the all of us became Christians at different parts in the time frame, but God already knew the whole time frame. The, it's not a perfect illustration, but the one I often have used, it's as if God has already watched the movie of your life and my life, and so he knows how the whole movie's going to go, and it's like it's being rewound and we're living it now. And so it, 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 that's where I still believe that the great argument of free will versus predestined sovereignty, I think the right answer is in the middle. Not the exact middle, but towards the middle. I think both can have truth that come to a middle answer to that. But that's not where we're going tonight. So, Yeah, he does. Yeah. Right, right. Right. He's already facilitated all that in to have us pray for people to leave. He's done all that. He's already got all that covered. Yeah. This could take us a week. Yeah. <laughs> And see, that's where I see it in the middle ground, Tammy, and you know that, is that I, I believe there's kind of a both and to it, to, to what you're saying and what she's saying. I think there's a both and to it, and I leave it to the mystery of God. And that's why both sides of the pe argument of people don't like me. I don't. <laughs> so, right. My goal is to make sure I know Christ and I do what I can do to make sure others know Christ. I am happy leaving the rest of it to find out when I get up top and see the big guy. I, I really am. Yeah, I've got wonderful Calvinist brothers and wonderful Wesleyan brothers, and so I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. So, uh, all right. Now, back on topic. Keep in mind, you folks led me off topic. And so, all right. So, in verse 4, are you ready to get to one of the more controversial parts that we have studied so far? Is everybody's brain ready? Right? James, you ready? <laughs> all right. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. So clearly the number of those who were sealed are all those that were given the mark that they belong to the Lord, right? Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. So, which Tammy kind of goes along with what you said, my sheep know my voice, okay? The number of those who were sealed was 144,000 <clears> from all the tribes of Israel. I am going to share with you a number of different perspectives on what people believe this number 144,000 mean. I'm going to start with what I consider the weakest argument and end with the two that I believe are very strong. There's two that I think both hold a lot of merit. 
But as I've told you, it's my job to present truth to you and allow the Spirit to guide you and not force feed you when just what I think. Amen? Amen? All right. And those that want to be on vestry have to agree with me. No, that's not true at all. My vestry knows that's not true. That is not true at all. All right. The first one, which I think we can all agree, the Jehovah Witnesses believe that the 144,000 represent the best 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses that ever lived. They're the leaders and they get to rule with Christ, and then all the other Jehovah Witnesses get to live on earth in kind of an earthly paradise. The rest of us, tough break, okay? Can we all agree that one's not going to work, right? <laughs> we won't take a lot of time on that, but I want you to know that that's what they believe. They believe the 144,000 are kind of the spiritual elite of the Jehovah Witnesses that have lived throughout, when did they start, like 1944 or something like that, up and through the end of time. So that's, that's what their perspective will be. <laughs> Yes, they do. And when they talk with you, they will look at you as an unbeliever, even though you're a believer in Christ. They'll look at you because you're not part of the 144,000. They do what? I'm, oh, no, because it's all about... It's all about their organization, yeah, and how they, well, to them, Jesus is less than God, so it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, he, he was brothers with the devil and everything like that, but we're not teaching on cults tonight, so you are tangenting me on purpose, all of you. So, okay, now, the view, and I want to be very fair here, so please feel free to ask questions or even disagree and talk with me if you disagree. The, the prominent view in pop Christianity, and I don't use that word negatively, I, by pop Christianity, I mean the teachers that you see on TV all the time, the ones that you hear on, not all the ones on the radio, that's not as much, but not anymore, but the TV and such, they tend to teach this perspective. You need to know that this perspective of the book of Revelation only began to exist about a hundred or so years ago, maybe a little more than that that the early church, all the way through the Reformation, all the way through the Great Awakenings, no one even knew about this because it was created in the 19... Well, no, I'm sorry, like the 1870s or 80s or something like that. So understand that it might be the big one that's taught in public now, but in theological circles, it's kind of, I don't want to say laughed at, but looked down upon. And so that's the background. You're like, just tell it to us, Matt. You got it. All right. <laughs> I want to be fair. I'm trying to be fair, even though I think it's bunk. Okay, there you go. I, I, <laughs> I'm trying to be a loving Christian. All right. First of all, the perspective forces a literal reading of this text. They believe exactly. Now, keep in mind, this perspective is called dispensationalism. And they believe that in chapter 4, the church was secretly raptured away. Many of you have probably heard of the secret rapture, right? Which means that as believers, we don't even need to read chapters 4 until about 19 because they're irrelevant for us because we're not going to be here. Okay, now when John wrote the book of Revelation, do you think he meant for chapters 4 through 18 to be irrelevant for the people reading it? Yeah. Okay, but that, that's truly what this would teach because the church is gone from their perspective. So there are no, no Christians on the earth at this moment. And they teach in an absolute literal reading that there will be 144,000 Jews. And to make it even more extreme, this same number is used a few chapters later about Jewish men who are virgins. So in other words, in, after the raptures happened in the time of tribulation, that seven-year period they teach, they believe 144,000 Jewish men who are virgins will be part of the 144,000 special people that God raises up during that time. Okay? I know it's an interesting perspective, but that, that's what is taught. <laughs> because they believe... Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Oh, you're great, good. Oh, because the Jews weren't Christians at the time. They believe, they believe there was ethnic Ju Judaism, ethnic Israel, which is the Old Testament. You understand what I mean by ethnic born a Jew, okay? They believe God halted his plan for the Jewish nation, put the church into the new covenant, and then he'll rapture us away to fulfill his work with the Jews in the end. 
So they believe the Jews who get saved, this 144,000, have a special place in heaven above what any non-Jew who gets converted during that time would get. So there's a favoritism type of thing that's going on. What's that? For them, it's that seven-year tribulation period after the church is gone. So then the church leaves. I know it's hard for us to understand because I've explained to you why I believe the church hasn't left at all. In fact, I find it difficult because if you remember back in chapter 1, what did John say? He said, I, John, your brother and, and companion, in suffering for the kingdom with patient endurance, testify about Jesus Christ. He saw himself in a time of suffering and tribulation when he wrote this book. And so to say that it's pushed off into the future is that I just believe bad Bible study. I use the word exegesis, but I don't use that word. Who, you mean Paul? Oh, John. He went back to Rome to be killed. <clears throat> yes, and when he was on the prison island of Patmos. That's when he's saying it. Yeah, yeah, it's an Italian island, but yeah, same idea. Oh, and by Rome. You're right, by Rome, yeah. So yeah, so he's in prison right now as he's writing this. Okay, let me kind of keep moving through this. I know, I, I'm, I feel like I'm... I'm going too deep, and I'm sorry, I don't, want to, I don't want us to feel burdened down by this, okay? They believe Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, um, they do not believe they're all considered one group. They believe that God has a plan for the Jewish, ethnically Jews, and for spiritual Israel, which is the church. Well, they wouldn't use that term. They believe there's two congruent covenants. Now, the problem with that is that Jesus doesn't have to die for the Jewish covenant because they're ethnic Jews. Does anybody see a problem with that? Yes, there is a problem with that. Okay, now, let me see here. <laughs> when I was talking it into my computer, it wrote ceiling, you know, like the ceiling. And so it's confusing me for a second, <laughs> threw me off. So no, the ceiling with an S of just the Jewish believers, though I believe goes contrary uh, to this later in the chapter, where in verse nine, we're going to read about the great multitude of every tribe, nation, and tongue. Okay, and of various languages and such. Now, the reason that I believe, a number of reasons I believe it does not work to believe this was 144,000 Jews. First of all, we don't know people's Jewish background anymore, do we? From the year 700 BC through the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Jews scattered across the world. They intermarried with other people, other faiths, other languages, other tribes. And so nobody has any clue if they're part of the tribe of Reuben or Judah or whoever that's described here. Can, everybody, can we agree with that? Okay. Now, their argument would be, but God knows. Now, how would you confront that argument? <laughs> I guess. Right? Right, and it's all been mixed together. So it's not like it was back in the, the Old Testament where the people of Judah married who? Other people of Judah. Benjamin married other people of Benjamin. They didn't mix very, very often. That's why the book of Ruth is so weird because they actually went and got Moabite people to marry their kids, which was so outrageous at the time. And so the idea that we can even have an ethnic Jewish nation anymore according to the tribes is truly ridiculous. Okay? <laughs> but there's no way you can do it. They may be trying to reestablish, but there's no way you could do it ethnically. You might be doing it some other way, but I. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
That's really good. I hadn't even thought of that particular verse. Did everybody hear when, um, in I believe it's Genesis 6, I'm pretty sure, where he says, he gives him the blessing and says, your, your descendants, thank you, I was going to say relatives, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. He was trying to help. Them. I actually had not considered that one. The one that came to my mind came from Je uh, Galatians 3, verses 29, where Paul says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. That verse, beyond a doubt, connects all believers, Jew, Gentile. We are all one in Christ. The previous church I was ministering at, they had a wonderful Jewish congregation of about 80 to 100 people. They, would, they were Christian, uh, they were Messianic Jews, and they would meet on Saturdays. We were able to let them use our church. Their services and days, they'd get there at 10 a.m. and leave at like 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. It was great, and we had a great relationship with them because they loved the same Savior that we love. And so we let them use our building and so forth. So you guys are all coming up with, with great stuff. And so there is no physical distinction anymore between the tribes and such. So now, with that being said, we know the Jehovah Witnesses aren't right. From my perspective, they are definitely not uh, 144,000 Jews. So then what would be the next thought of what they could be? Anyone have any thoughts on who they think the 144,000 are? Because it's extremely relevant to the whole rest of the book. What's that? Oh, you read ahead, cheater. No, <laughs> you and your Bible. No, yes. What about the canonized saints? Like, but from God's perspective, they're just all part of the great multitude in heaven. Like, we're not going to get to heaven and he's going to be like, oh, you were canonized. You get the front row, you know. <laughs> we're, we're all one in Christ. You know, maybe Anglican priests get to move up, but maybe back. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? It could be back. And so we honor them here on earth, which I see nothing wrong with, because we honor the, the, their lives and, the way, and what they did. But in heaven, we're all part of the great multitude because there is no favoritism. There is nothing like that in heaven. So does that kind of answer your question? All right. Let me share with you my perspective. Oh, and just a reminder that in Revelation 2 and 3, the Jews that rejected Christ and were persecuting uh, the Christians, do you remember what uh, John called them? The synagogue of Satan. I think that kind of shares the thought process there too. Okay? So I hope I did okay explaining that to you. I, I really am trying to be honoring, and maybe by doing so I'm being less clear than I should be. But Okay. <laughs> These last two, I believe, can bleed together and have a lot of merit to it. And I would offer, I believe this is the, the clearest and cleanest translation of what this means. Now, it says the 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Now, first of all, all the tribes of Israel are not listed. No matter if somebody's calling you about it or not, they are not listed. And so... They just want to listen to the Bible study. Say, listen, and just put it on speaker. It's good. <coughs> the the 144,000. Now, I am going to explain to you from Scripture why I believe this. So <coughs> this isn't just Matt talking here. And, and in scholarly circles, this is the, the well-received understanding. And I even have quotes from people all the way back to the year 200 about why this was believed by those people, too. Okay, so the 144,000, you know, we ran out of time. We'll do this next week. No, I'm just kidding. No, the 144,000, I know, yeah. The 144,000 represent the entire multitude that we're about to read about in the next verse of every man, woman, and child from the day Jesus rose again through the day he comes again, who's a follower of Christ. Now, the first question is, you mean there's only going to be 144,000? Yes, we're in competition. No, I don't mean that at all. Because these numbers are symbolic numbers. Do you remember all the way back in the very first chapter, we are told how to read this book. It says the revelation, or actually the Greek word is the apocalypto, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what would soon take place. You cannot read apocalyptic literature the way you read the book of Acts. 
It'd be like me saying, okay, I want you to read a biography about Abraham Lincoln, and then I want you to watch the Rugrats cartoon. Both are totally true. That would be silly, right? Because one's a cartoon and they do all kinds of weird stuff that you can't do, and one's hopefully an accurate biography. And so when you read Acts, it's a historical biography. When we read this, it's a prophetic picture with symbols, and the numbers represent things. And as we saw, the horses aren't literal, horse, literal horses that gallop across the country, right? No, they're a picture of demonic entities going forth. Is everybody with me? And so when we see the number 144,000, it represents how many tribes were there in, Old Test in the Old Testament? And the 12 tribes represented all the people of Israel, correct? There were always 12, though. There were always... Yeah, and, and now the same thing will be true of what we say with the apostles. How many apostles were there? Wow. Right? And eventually Judas was chucked, and who did they add? Matthias. Matthias, another Matthew, which shows you why that name's a good name. And so you had 12. What is 12 times 12? Right? And then you add it to a thousand. And you might say, why just add a thousand to it? I'll explain that to you in a minute. And what number do you get to? 144,000. Okay. Now, uh, it's my job to show you through scripture why we can do that with those numbers. That I'm not just saying, so take this times this and woohoo, you got it. You know, I don't want to, it's not like that. We're going to first of all start with the number thousand. In 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 8, listen to what is said. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand, thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now that's not just a simple scripture that's in there. That's actually a scripture that is quoted also from the Old Testament in Psalm 90, verse 4, where it says, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or a watch of the night. Okay? So do you see how regularly in Scripture, and there's many more examples, but do you see how regularly in Scripture a day is compared to what? Because a thousand years is a number of completion in the Old, in the old and the New Testament, the way the, the, Bible, the way the writings of the Bible were written. So the number thousand represents a completion of everything. It doesn't necessarily, because we certainly don't think to God it's exactly like a thousand years, Right? We understand that it's a symbolic number, meaning, a, yeah, a concept, that in God's sight, a day is like an, an eternity. I mean, that's what they're saying. Yes? You follow me? Okay. What's that? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. More than one number, that means that. Yes. Yes, there is. And so then I'm going to invite you, actually, if you'd like, because it's close by, to turn to Revelation chapter 20. Is it 20? Actually, no, I'm sorry, 21. Let's go to 21 to save a little time here. Look at what number gets used over and over again. It says, from verse 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me. What number is being used a lot? Come, I will show you the bride and the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain on a great hill and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down from, the, from heaven from God. Verse 11. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of precious jewels, jasper, clear crystal. Some of you might have a different translation. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of who? 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. The wall of the city had how many foundations? And on them were? And so the holy city is built upon the saints of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Does everybody see that symbolism there in Revelation 21? Okay? It's an, it's, I don't think it's a big jump because we're, re we're reading in the same book, which means the same symbols are represented all the way throughout it. If 12 meant completeness in chapter 21, it means it where? In chapter 7 where we are at now. So... 
Here we are when it says from the tribes of Judah, 12,000, and Reuben, 12,000, Gad, 12,000, and so forth, with a number of 144,000. And right after that, what does verse 9 say? After this, which means what? What does after this mean? A new vision. So we have two visions in one chapter. Does everybody catch that? Every time you see after this or after this I saw or I hear it's after this I looked, it is a new vision we are given. Step-by-step -step visions. So this is the same thing. It says, after this I looked and there before me was who? A great multitude no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. He is referring back to what was just said. The 144,000 representing the New and Old Testament saints all together before the throne of God. It is a, it's a symbolic picture of you, me, you, you, our great aunt who died, our, you know, our, our great, great, great uncle who passed away, all who die in Christ are part of this great multitude, will be part of this great multitude standing before the throne of God. Now, I need to know, and I, and I mean this seriously now, I can, go with, I can go back to these 12,000 things and give you just a little bit of interesting uh, information, but if you feel like we've gone deep enough, I'll keep moving forward. Finish the chapter, move forward. Wimps. All right. That's fine. That's fine. No, that's fine. Because it, it's not as important as the rest of it. And so that's fine. So, all right. Yeah, we only got 15 more minutes. Let me get Oh, we're going to get to that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not skipping anything. I just am not going to go back and describe what the different tribes represent. Uh, we're going to skip over that for now. But if anyone's interested, I can go over with you. Um, after this, I looked there before me was a great multitude. No one could count. Every nation, tribe, language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes. And as we've talked about, white robes represent. And how are we made pure? And as Christ makes us pure, we are now righteous in his sight. And so our very existence in the throne room is because of what Christ has done for us. We stand there on his righteousness, making us clean in our white robes. And they were holding palm branches. And that brings us back to what Christian holiday? Palm Sunday leading into Easter. And they waved the palms as a symbol of what? victory Christ victory now they thought they were waving them for what victory over Rome and all the oppressors of Israel they didn't realize that prophetically and symbolically they were waving them for his victory over sin death and the grave and victory in our lives of those things yes That's right. That's the victory that he's bought for us. And they are all experiencing that now. And it, it, it's weird how it's, you know, I, I want, I've said it to you before. Jesus can be here and yet coming at the same time, right? Yeah. And so we are actually here in this verse and yet not there. Isn't that interesting? Because God lives outside of time. So this picture of the final remnant of all believers, we're actually there already. But we're not there. Does that mess with you a little bit? Yeah. Chew on that for the rest of the night when you go to sleep. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm just glad I'm there and bring as many as we can with us. Amen. Now, this is interesting. And they cried out in a loud voice. I'm going to get on my 30-second pulpit. I believe, as Christians, I'm not just saying Christ Church, that on a Sunday morning, we need to bring it a little more sometimes. Amen? Do you know what I mean by a modern vernacular, bring it? Like, I understand we come and, and you know, there's a lot of stuff we're, we're weighing on. You know, I, I get here real early and I, I get late Saturday nights and everything. You're bummed because your football team lost or whatever. But you come on Sunday morning, man. I feel like if we're having a cruddy week, we come ready to praise Him in the storm. If we're having a great week, we should come ready to praise Him in victory. I would love that when Libby and the other singers get up here that we blow them back. Yeah. 
when they start. Sing with us. Amazing! You know, we just crank it out, you know? We're like, Ugh. And I give you permission to sing out of key. Absolutely. In fact, it'll mess with them even more and make it more fun. So, yeah. But I just want to offer. I'm having fun with it, but I want to offer. What do you think, Shelly? Shelly's like, yeah, I'll hold it. So. You like it? Yeah, okay. So. Yes. And so, I, now, it might sound like I, I'm having fun with it, but I do think there should always be something in us that seeks to praise the Lord. In the midst of, of horrific circumstances or glorious circumstances. And here is just this picture of all the multitude shouting. And remember, they have new bodies in heaven, which means they can yell a lot louder than us, and their voice doesn't go hoarse after a while. So theirs is a continuous ruckus of joy. Is that possible? Ruckus of joy works for me. Ruckus, I don't think I've ever used those words together. That's where it works for me, though. Ruckus of joy going on. As together they declare, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's as, it, it's as if they're shouting his praise and mocking the enemy at the same time. That they're just saying, this is the truth of everything. And we want to declare it. And then, as if it's not enough that all God's people do it, what happens next? Angels are like, you ain't showing us up. That's my translation. I admit that's my translation. But that would be the worship team saying, we're going to come back in here. And they jump in. All the angels were, think of all the angels, the multitude of heaven's armies are joining us. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God. And this is just so creative. What's the first thing they say? Amen. Anybody know what the, 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 the deeper meaning behind the Hebrew or the Greek word amen is? It means so be it. What, what did you, is, I agree. It's all within that same thing. It's as if you're saying done. Our, in our modern time, it would be like me saying, drop the mic, boom, we're done. I won't do that, Martin, okay, I won't drop. But, but it's saying that this is it. And what's wonderful is when they say amen, the amen actually means always was amen, always is amen, always will be amen. Because they're saying this from outside of time. So amen, praise and glory wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God. And together again, they said, Amen. Amen. And they declared together all with a loud voice. All right. Page four of 30 we're up to. Just kidding. But okay. Then one of the elders asked me in the white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And John being smarter than Peter was sometimes with Jesus when he was on earth, said, surely you know. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. If an angel asks you something and you don't know the answer, just say, but surely you know. <laughs> it's a good statement of humility and it keeps you from getting in trouble. So just a little note if you ever come across an angel in your life, all right? <laughs> so, all right. And he said, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. Now, Again, from what's called a dispensational perspective, the rapture happens, seven years of great tribulation, and Jesus comes again. John clearly, from the beginning of this book, says, your brother in tribulation. He understood as he talked to the churches. He said, he will see you through your tribulation. He saw them as living in tribulation at that moment. And there's this idea that it will get worse and worse until he comes again. Have you ever heard that before? That's actually nowhere in the scriptures. I invite anyone to find it. I, I've read the Bible through quite a few times. I've never found it. It's the idea, that's a theology that they took and they put on top of the book of Revelation to, think, to, to, to fit their theology. But really, it means all through this time, you and I are going through different levels of suffering and tribulation. Now, here in our part of the world, it may not be as physical sometimes as a story I just read about a Nigerian pastor who was woken up in the middle of the night. Someone came in, 
They, they beat up his family, dragged him away, and kept him in jail for a couple months, all the while beating him so senseless the other prisoners thought that he was dead. And then they finally allowed him to go back home, beaten and destroyed, and the church was there ministering to him as he stood right back up in the pulpit and preached the gospel the very next week. So we cannot connect with that. I get that. But that doesn't mean that the things we go through on this earth are not frustrations and struggles and hardships and tribulation. Amen? Just because someone may go through a harder tribulation than me doesn't make mine easier. Amen? And so God is with each of us through these different highs and lows of our life. And he's saying, as you come out of it, the goal of the restraining seal of the Spirit on your life and mine is that we will come to the end of our lives still saying, Amen, I am the Lord's. And as he seals us with that, and he releases the horsemen across the earth, they bring suffering to the church, but they cannot break us. It's really the story of Job, isn't it? Where the devil just keep pounding and pounding him, hurt his family, hurt everything. But in the end, he did not compromise his integrity about God. And God commended him at the end. And so you and I will go through times of great struggle, times when we even question God at times. But we can remember the great scripture that says he won't leave us or forsake us. And that through him, we aren't just conquerors, right? We are more than conquerors that means we have conquered here and we carry that into eternity with us but we're more than conquerors how does anybody remember through christ jesus our lord we realize that we don't conquer sin and temptation and everything else because we're all so great right anytime we lose that humility uh, god's quick to show us otherwise but through him and the guidance of his spirit he has sealed us to fight for him, not again fight, I mean you know, in spiritual sense, for him until eternity when we will one day be with him. So do you see the, the, the victorious message and why when he was giving this book of Revelation to a church that was being persecuted and attacked, why this was such good news? This isn't meant to be a scary book. Have we had a chapter yet where you left scared? Every chapter is exalting Christ and our position with him, letting us know that we win because he wins. Amen? Amen. Oh, man, I got four minutes. All right. You let me preach, Robin. You're supposed to stop me. Okay, well, I need a new person to be my checker then. All right. All right. These are those that have come out of the great tribulation. That includes us. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's us, right? By the grace of God. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. You know, for someone that does not love God and even can't stand God, does the idea of serving Him day and night sound like a fun thing? <laughs> Seems like a burden, doesn't it? But I know all of us have either served a spouse or a child or someone we cared about, and we actually found a blessing out of blessing them. Is that fair to say? That is what it will be like in heaven because, A, we don't get tired, we don't get frustrated, we don't get angry. We will find great joy in blessing him as he blesses us for being his. Yeah. Yes, from 9 through 17, again, it's outside of time. That's where I say, call us that it's us, but it's not us yet. That it's all those old and new saint, New Testament saints who have gone before us are there, like in the real sense now, but we are also outside of time. God already sees us there in this scripture. Well, that's, and you're right here. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, we're on the same page. Yeah, absent from the body, present with the Lord. The thief, he said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. It all, it all works together, yeah. So yes, yeah, so, that, so that's them. Like right now, if you had a friend named Joe who passed away yesterday, he's in the presence of the Lord. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Yeah, I would see that as a, that would definitely be a precursor and a picture and more than just a symbol. I agree with you that it's a representation of this happening 
in heaven happening on earth for us when we partake in communion. Which is why we don't take it in an unworthy manner, which is what the scripture says. So, <clears throat> all right, we're going to jump through these last couple and we'll be done, folks. Everybody hanging in okay? Yeah. I know it's late, but man, this is good stuff. <laughs> all right. Uh, and he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over him. The word tent, do you have a different, anybody have a different uh, translation than tent? Shelter, dwelling, tabernacle is a good translation. It's pretty much that verse where it says, his banner over me is love. In other words, he's placing us in his protective care forever and ever. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. Um, I don't have time to go there, but if you're interested in this little part of scripture, you're welcome to put Ezekiel 37, because this is where it talks about the temple and the saints. Like uh, John is in a sense going copying what Ezekiel 37 the second half of it said uh, 22 through 27 uh, says and so again I don't have time to go there tonight but just know that there are comparable scriptures so you see it in the old and you see it in the new testament also never again will they hunger never again will they thirst amen, amen. the sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat why because the lamb's going to be the light amen Right. I won't need to borrow your little air conditioner anymore, brother. We'll be good. It'll all be good. You can leave it here. I don't have to pack it in the casket. All right. Won't need it. Yeah, Junior Warden, no more complaints about anything. Nothing wears out anymore, praise God. Amen. No Junior Wardens in heaven. For the Lord is at the center of the throne, and he will be their shepherd. And that's an image we've seen all through Scripture, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yes. He will lead them to springs of living water. And you'll see that in Psalm 1, if you, ever, if you want to reference that. And God will wipe away every single tear from their eye. Just, just as a quick note, and I'll let us go. In Isaiah 49, and I, I'm doing this just because it's so important to see Revelation doesn't stand on its own. I think I read something like 60 or 70 percent of Revelation is referred to by the prophets in the Old Testament. So it goes back and forth. It's not like God just came up with a new fresh idea. This was his plan from the beginning of eternity. List it's on, yeah. Right, we're working in that. And so in Isaiah 49, 10, it says, They hunger or thir or do they do not hunger or thirst. Uh, there will be no desert, no heat, nor sun to beat upon them. He who has compassion on them, meaning God, will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. Does that sound familiar? We just read it. So that's Isaiah 49, if anybody wants that. I think. All right, so just the, the overall conclusion. The conclusion that all Christians are included in this picture of eternal bliss confirmed by the fact that the group with the white robes in verse 9 is the same as those that come out of the great tribulation and the same group has the robes and uh, the palms and together we will worship him forever and ever amen, amen. sound good so you saw one perspective in chapter 6 the blue piece of paper in chapter 7, you saw the yellow, and now and you'll see in 8 that we'll get to the seventh seal of the golden censure. We'll start that in five minutes. Go take a potty break. Just kidding. No, I'm not even ready to go over it myself. Okay. Um, you're welcome to come up and ask any questions, disagree or whatever. Does anybody have anything for the group they'd like to ask real quick before I let you go? To him, a day is like a thousand years, baby. So... <laughs> He's good. <laughs> he had it planned from before he, eternity passed. All right. All right. Well, you are all dismissed. Thank you for hanging with me in this lesson. And again, feel free to text me during the week if you can't remember something or you have questions. I love interacting theologically with you. So, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure.